live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the inside scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and tonight we are talking with the leadership team, or at least part of the leadership team, of Northern Virginia Family Service. You may know them as NVFS. In this segment, we are talking with Andrea Eck. She is the Executive Vice President of Programs. Thank you so much for being here, Andrea. Thank you for having us. So your organization has been around a long time, so I'm going to guess that you're not original to the organization. I am not. <laughs> Um, Northern Virginia Family Service was started in 1924, so actually next year we'll be celebrating 95 years of service to our community. 95 is a long time, so I'm guessing that your program has truly evolved in 95 years as to the kinds of ser services that you're providing to families. You know, what have you seen changed just in your tenure, you know, overseeing some of the development and the implementations of your programs? Sure. Well, I think that's one of the things that's great about NBFS is that we are really responsive to community need. So as needs change over time, we also change our programming. Um, you know, starting back uh, with our response to 9-11, we developed the Survivors Fund project in, in coordination with the Community Foundation and National Capital Region. Um, and over time, as um, uh, our community is impacted by different trauma or different um, uh, uh, changing landscape politically or economically, then we are here to develop the programs that will best meet the needs of our residents. And that's true because the area has changed a lot since 1924. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a very diverse population, a very multicultural population that has created different kinds of challenges in delivering basic services. You've also had an opportunity to acquire some other programs mm -hmm. too. So it's not all been developing it from the ground up. You've also partnered and eventually absorbed some other programs. Right, in just the last decade or so, we were able to merge with uh, Serve in Prince William County, which uh, uh, allows us to provide shelter and uh, hunger resource center and a variety of programs um, at our campus in Manassas. Uh, we were uh, able to merge with the Center for Multicultural Human Services and the Hispanic Committee, um, which also allows us to broaden our scope uh, to include immigration legal services and mental health services, which you'll hear a little bit more about later tonight. So, um, and in addition to the organizations that we've merged with or acquired over time, we obviously work in close collaboration with all of our nonprofit and government partners uh, throughout the region to make sure that we're meeting the evolving needs. Because it's a, it's a, it's a big territory, just Northern mm -hmm. Virginia itself, and it's a tremendous population, over a million people just in Fairfax County alone. Mm -hmm. and, and while we are considered a very wealthy county, depending on what zip code you're living mm -hmm. in, there are these islands of poverty or islands where uh, populations are tremendously challenged. Yeah. So, you know, talk a little bit about how you have, you know, tried to meet people where they are in these different pockets. Exactly. So we, Northern Virginia Family Service serves just about over 34,000 individuals across the region every year. Um, and we do know that um, because of the, the prosperity of the region that sometimes poverty is masked. Um, but we, we work with individuals in a variety of different programs um, to try to help their family reach sustainability. So we focus on workforce development, we look at um, housing programs, we look at early childhood development programs. Um, and really I think what's unique about Northern Virginia Family Service, because we're a multi-service organization, our, our programs really work together in order to deliver a deeper impact on the families that we're serving. So it's really an incredible opportunity to sort of um, integrate our services together to make sure that we're, um, that we're not just meeting the need um, for the family, the, the, the issue that they walk through the door with, but really thinking about the entire family and how to move them to a greater level of self-sufficiency. You know, and silos has always been a major problem. Somebody comes in for one thing and they walk out the door and you don't realize that there are three other things that they actually mm -hmm. need. And while you can't provide them all, you also collaborate with other organizations who can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we can do, uh, with a variety of our programs, we can, um, we can integrate our services, bring mental health services to our workforce development or our shelter programs, uh, but we obviously rely then on the nonprofit partners in the community uh, to provide services that we can or provide capacity that we can't. 
Right, and, and we are very fortunate in the Northern Virginia area. There's sort of a nonprofit industrial complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the people who watch this show know that I sit on the board of Bright Paths. Mm -hmm. And so we are working with some of the s same kinds of families that you are. And mm -hmm. a lot of these families are working. And I think, you know, I recently had Deepak Madala on this show talking about Medicaid expansion and enrolling people in the newly expanded Medicaid. And here's the thing that's interesting about that is most people are already working. Mm -hmm. Like they keep talking about work requirements in mm -hmm. order to take advantage, but don't you find that your clients generally are working, not only that, working more than one job? Absolutely, in our shelter program alone, 60% of the households are working. Um, I know when I uh, take people to the shelter to show them around and, and show them our services there, uh, folks are always surprised to say that the shelter is empty during the day. Kids are at school and families are working. Um, so it's, it's whether or not they have all of the resources that they need in order to maintain that stability. This is an expensive place to live. Um, and you know, to have quality, affordable, accessible childcare, mental health support, housing support, um, really takes uh, you know the collaboration of of local government, of our nonprofit partners. Um, it takes everybody working together. It absolutely does, and you don't have a staff of thousands. You have mm -hmm. a, you have a core staff, and you operate a lot of these programs using volunteers. Absolutely. So we have um, just about 400 employees across the region, um, but there are programs in our organization that absolutely don't happen without the support of volunteers. Our Hunger Resource Center in Manassas is a great example of that. Um, uh, from picking up food to shelving it to giving it out to our clients every month, uh, we rely on volunteers in every single program within our organization. In workforce development, we have volunteers who work in our Training Futures program as mentors and trainers. Um, so really critical, uh, the, all of our volunteers play a really critical role in helping us deliver services. So, and of course, so for, you know, the housing issue in Northern Virginia is at a crisis point, not just here, it's across the country. Mm -hmm. You know, the lack of affordable housing, affordable housing being housing that meets a variety of needs depending on what you earn because there are a lot of people who have service jobs in our area need service jobs and they happen to be low wage mm -hmm. and so a lot of this homelessness you see is not because people aren't working but simply because there's an inadequate housing in in an area that they can afford and so you recently were the recipient of a grant from McKinsey and Jeff Bezos Bezos mm -hmm. um, that's giving you money mainly because I think they recognize that mm -hmm. of the 24 organizations that they chose you are doing an effective job at meeting the needs of people who fall into this category. We are extremely honored to have been one of the uh, 24 organizations to receive um, one of these inaugural awards. And I think it does um, speak to the history and reputation of our organization. Um, we are really excited about the work that we're going to be able um, to continue to do and the enhancements we're, we'll be able to make in our homeless services program specifically. Um, but we also see this as a tremendous responsibility as the only organization in Northern Virginia to have been awarded, the only um, one of three in the D.C. region to have been awarded. So we, we really want to make sure that we're leveraging the investment that they've made in us on behalf of the entire community. We feel a lot of responsibility and are very excited to get started. Well, and I think it really is, it's, it's, it's more than just the money and the grant, it's the fact that they saw you as a, a good place to invest money to meet the needs of the greatest number of people. Mm -hmm. And as we said, there's a lot of people, there are a lot of people in this region who are multi, they come from other countries. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Homelessness has a lot of different, you know, root causes. Mm -hmm. But in this case, and I know having worked with Training Futures before, a lot of people come in with a variety of hurdles. They might have a PhD mm -hmm. in there from China, mm -hmm. but they don't speak the language, they don't know computers, and it's just very hard to find a, a place for them where they can earn a living wage. Absolutely, and that's why uh, with this investment we're going to um, enhance our housing locator services. We're going to add some career navigation services so we can make sure folks are connected to whether it's Northern Virginia Family Service programs like Training Futures or other programs in the community to get training um, to connect with you know sustainable wage uh, positions. We're going to um, uh, further enhance our mental health services available in our homeless service programs. Um, so really again trying to um, impact the entire person, the entire family, and end um, homelessness for that family. Uh, so we're, we're excited. 
Well, I think what has always impressed me about NVFS too is that you are responsive to whatever the current situation is. And you mentioned in passing, you know, programs around immigration. Mm -hmm. You know, clearly that is just, just you know, people know the headlines, it's a very contentious subject, but people are here and they require services. And I think that NVFS early on took a stand about who they were going to help. Mm -hmm. And these are our neighbors, and uh, they are here, and they're a part of our community. Uh, they're children in our schools. They're, they're, they're the families that work in our, in our community. Um, and, uh, you know, we are here and dedicated to uh, supporting them with mental health um, supports, with immigration legal supports. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we are all stronger um, when we support each other and support all of our neighbors. It, ha it has been a difficult, um, uh, you know, period of time for, um, for those clients in particular. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of um, not knowing what's going to happen, and so we, we try to stay the course, make sure that they know and understand our services, what we're here and available to, to do to help them. And I think that is so important. And, and we're going to talk a little bit later on as we talk to some of your colleagues about finding ways in order, you know, so that you can meet people where they are because transportation is also not very easy. We were talking before the show about it's not just that you have services available, it's how can people access them? Mm -hmm. How do people get to the services? Mm -hmm. Well, we really strive to make sure that all of our services are of the highest quality as well as accessible and we'll hear about that more when we talk about mental health. Um, our mental health services are, are very accessible. They're happening in the community. They're happening in an office setting. Um, we go into the schools. Our, our mental health services are, are trauma-informed. They are culturally competent um, because we really want to, as you said, meet people where they are, where they feel safe, where they feel comfortable, where they'll build that trusting relationship with us. Uh, so it's, it, it, whether it's early childhood education or workforce development, housing, mental health, uh, our, the folks that we serve uh, need to be able to access our services. And all in one place, through one doorway, mm -hmm. not, not in silos. And I really right. do think that integrating your services, kind of doing a really thorough intake to mm -hmm. figure out what it is that families need to be successful, is something that MVF offers that maybe not every nonprofit does. Some of us are far more narrow in our scope and how the, we can help families. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for Andrea, having me. Thank you. When we come back from our break, we're going to be talking to some of Andrea's colleagues, also with Northern Virginia Family Service. They have multiple programs, and as we talked about, many of those programs rely on volunteers. So I hope you'll stay tuned and figure out how you can get involved. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. Big responsibility. Oh, it's huge. I know, it's huge. Yeah, and the salary. Oh my god, yes. I right? mean, like, I was literally, I was about to move with my parents, and <laughs> right before, the, yeah, so this saved me. I, I really believe in you, you know? Thank you. It's nice to hear that from someone. <laughs> These are cool. Did you, um, what did you?
we're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. Tonight we are talking with the leadership team from Northern Virginia Family Service. In this segment, we're talking with Meredith McKean. She is the director of, of the Multicultural Center and Youth Initiatives. Welcome, Meredith. Thank you. You have a super, super long title, <laughs> like it's very long. It so explain exactly what falls under your particular program area. Absolutely. We have um, under the Multicultural Center and our Youth Initiatives programs, um, we have an array of services that are designed to provide a holistic sort of trauma recovery services um, for immigrant populations who've experienced violence. Um, our Multicultural Center is a site where people can come, feel welcome, um, receive services in currently it's about seven different languages and our services are designed to provide again the range of services that folks need to recover from either a traumatic experience or just the acculturation process and immigration process so we have immigration legal services we have trauma mental health services and we have what we call case management services mm. which are helping people either with their basic needs or sort of navigating the vast array of services that are available in the community that people may not know about. So we have people who guide them um, and sort of help them set their goals and figure out what it is that they need to feel safe, um, hopeful, and, and productive. And then on our youth side, we have a set of services that include a gang prevention program. We also have services for young people who have witnessed violence either in the community, um, in their homes, in their schools, in their home country um, or during their journey here. And we also have um, services that are mental health services that are designed to be accessible. So I'll talk about that um, in terms of how we design our programs. But the, the goal of both sets of programs is really to support people with the range of services that they need to, to recover from, from the experience of violence and trauma. And, and, it's, and I've had other people on this show before um, the Tahrir Justice Center. Um, I know that there's a lot of um, organizations, including faith communities, that work with people coming into this country as refugees or people who have come into this country without a base, without um, a family or a community that can help them to assimilate and to adjust. And so this, this kind of begs the question, I guess, is to how we can go about making sure that people in these immigrant communities know to come to NVFS. So explain a little bit about how you do outreach. How do people know where to find you? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I think we do it in a number of different ways. A lot of our outreach is actually um, from the clients who already work with us. So sort of a word of mouth yeah. um, because we're known as a provider that is safe and accessible. And as I said earlier, our services are available in a number of different languages, but we also have staff who themselves are from the same communities that we serve so people are, are known um, and then the the other really important part about our outreach is, is our collaborations so the partners that we work with um, I think consider MVFS to be an essential partner in the provision of services um, for example our school systems call on right. us a lot to be able to reach out to a community that that may be more isolated or may not know as you said sort of know that they have a right to have services or may not be familiar with how you access services. So we sort of blanket the community um, directly. And then we also work with anybody who might be a service provider, might come into contact um, and sort of uh, spread okay. the word. Okay, right. Because you know, I do always wonder how do people hear about it? Word mm -hmm. of mouth, obviously. Yep. But then again, I never thought about providers being uh, source of referrals mm -hmm. for you. Yeah, that's probably our primary referral source. Um, our other collaborative partners who are working with people or um, some of our services, for example, we actually co-locate with partners. So a really oh. great example, one of our mental health providers is actually placed at Arlington Free Clinic. So this is a location where 
people would come already for a set of services. And so we are able to, while they're coming for their medical care, also offer mental health services. You know, it's interesting you say that because I've had Bassam Khan on here before from mm -hmm. Neighborhood Health. And he said what they always do with every patient they see is screen for mental health, yes. particularly depression. And mm -hmm. I had like no idea. I mean, it's, it's like such a no brainer when somebody says that. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me Fairfax County has really done in the main a good job with identifying mental health, our diversion first program, mm -hmm. our crisis intervention training for yes. our mental, uh, for our law enforcement and public safety people. We were really kind of acknowledging that, that a lot of problems, whether it's trauma or homelessness, at its root is untreated, undiagnosed mental illness. Absolutely. Yes, and I think we've seen um, in the community a, a, an increased awareness, I think, of the importance of mental health and an understanding that mental health and wellness um, go together and that there are a number of supports that are needed to that would contribute to somebody's sort of health and well-being. But our local jurisdictions are absolutely, I think, doing a lot of our effort around decreasing the stigma and right. really looking at, as you said, access issues and availability issues and sort of where are the gaps in, in services, whether it's for youth or adults. Um, and I think creating partnerships that make those services accessible to everybody in the community. And so what area do you serve? Because we haven't really talked about your service area. So you've got partners and so it mm -hmm. probably varies a little bit. Yes. So in the Multicultural Center and Youth Initiatives, we have services um, in every jurisdiction in Northern Virginia. We, a lot of our services, um, while our Multicultural Center is in Falls Church, we actually serve people from the DC metro region, um, depending on the program and their need. And then on our Youth Initiative side, we actually provide services in what we call our mobile model. So meaning we bring services to the community. So we are actually um, in our family reunification program, for example, um, in some of our violence prevention programs, we're in most of the jurisdictions. Um, That's so very we interesting. Have a, yeah. So play, explain a little bit. You said family reunification mm -hmm. programs. I'm very interested okay. in that. What does that <laughs> exactly involve? Sure. So we actually have a number of, in this particular case, reunification is referring to young people who were separated from their parents. Um, for a period of time due to an immigration related separation. Right. So we have many families in our community where parents came to the country first um, and after working for a really long time, probably longer than they thought, it takes a little bit longer often for people to be able to save enough money and, and bring their children to join them. So generally on average a separation of about 10 years. Um, so wow. children are joining their parents and in general, while everybody's very excited and it's, a, it's an important time for families, it's also full of challenge because these are children and parents who've been separated for 10 years um, who often have made a really difficult and arduous journey to get to the United States. So we're seeing, and you said it earlier, this sort of unaddressed trauma right. is very, very common and, and creates sometimes symptoms um, and behaviors that are challenging or confusing. Um, and they're coming together at a time when they're also, they don't know each other as well. So this is a very vulnerable, but resilient <laughs> at the same time right. group of young people. Um, so we are dedicating a lot of resources to supporting families early um, in their reunification process and we've seen incredible results. And when you provide support and the opportunity um, for both the, the young person and the parent to learn something about each other's experience um, and, and look at ways to address the trauma, then we see a lot of wonderful changes. And we look at that as sort of, um, it's child abuse prevention, it's foster care placement prevention, it's juvenile justice involvement prevention. It is really putting resources early um, so that young people can thrive um, because we know they have the capability, they just need extra support. And to me, this is a great example of how Northern Virginia Family Service has created a program in response to a need that's mm -hmm. been identified. Yes. Like this is probably not a program you've had forever. Yes. It's come about because someone said we have we're identifying this trend or this or mm -hmm. this something that keeps popping up. Yes. It, you know, and, and and is that kind of how you are widening or scaling or developing what you do is looking for the trends or someone saying we've identified? Yeah, I think it's actually often what we do is sometimes identify what are the unmet needs or the unaddressed needs. So we have been serving youth through some of our youth initiatives programs for 10 or more years. And the family reunification program, for example, started as a, it's a federal program. So it's young people, it's federally funded and it's young people coming out of a federal process. But what we realized while we're providing those services at that 
these are young people and parents who don't have access to mental health services through our public system. And at the same time, realizing that there are young people in need beyond those that are receiving services through this, this federal program. So it's an opportunity because of all of our partnerships to continue to expand that program. Um, and I think we're, we're lucky in Northern Virginia that, that people, so schools are a partner, um, community and public health providers, um, people really sort of understand the importance of, of intervening and I think look to Northern Virginia Family Service to be that partner um, to provide this set of services then that lets teachers teach. Um, you know, let's parents parent. We can support other organizations' work by providing some of these core set of services that really um, nobody else is providing. We're pretty uniquely, I think, positioned. positioned. And exactly. you have credibility. And the other thing that came up in the last segment is about trust. Mm -hmm. You know, the people that you are providing services to have to trust you, but other organizations have to trust mm -hmm. you <laughs> too. And you mentioned something interesting about there was a federal program. Mm -hmm. You know, how often do you get a grant or you'll be part of a federal program or a county program mm -hmm. where it addresses a certain number of people, but then you're able to take your own resources to expand the mm -hmm. base that you're serving? Yeah, I think that is something that, that's happening a lot, especially in, in youth initiatives in the multicultural center, but I think probably across a lot of our programs. So in addition, to the programs I talked about where we're providing mental health services in a number of ways with exactly that model is there may be a core set of services that one funder will fund right. but if we are able because of our experience um, and because of our reputation to leverage foundation funding for example to say that we know for example um, you know, the basic case management services are paid for, for example, but we know that what somebody needs to get to a place of safety and hope and optimism um, is also mental health services and may also be workforce services or the array of services. So I think that's something we do very well, um, is looking at how do we bring the other resources we have? What other funding sources can we leverage? Um, and I think we've been able to grow and scale um, a lot of our well, programs you know, I would, I would observe that that is a, a skill set all by itself, mm -hmm. and not just the, the quality of the services and the program, but the fact that you have gotten very good at expansion, scaling, yep. leveraging, <laughs> looking for the, you know, the funding and how you can do something else with it. I mean, that really is its own skill set. And hence the, the big title. No, I think that's something I, we, we take a lot of pride in. Um, I would say that that's a hallmark of, of a lot of our programs. And I think that sort of opportunity that we have to, to either bridge services across our agency, um, but to, I think, really always look at what is the unmet need in our community because we don't want to duplicate. There are incredible right. services. We're, again, very lucky in general in Northern Virginia. But how do we focus our efforts on what is most needed so that we can keep expanding? Absolutely. Well, because it seems like the need is not going to be decreasing anytime soon. And so I think as you learn more about what people need, mm -hmm. NBFS is very well positioned. Thank you so much, Meredith, for being in this segment. Please join us after the break because we have other people we're going to talk to. All right, pal. Get ready for the day, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Do we have a gun? What's up? Do we have a gun? Hmm. Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. I love it. Cross-referencing travel sites. And booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh. But now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Last night at high school... I tried Oxy at a couple of parties. I thought I had it under control. I didn't know it'd be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. <sighs> Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth.
what to expect when you're expecting. Like you? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to team-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys. Preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for the Mom, you don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. <laughs> We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me in this segment is Julie Mullen. She is the Director of Workforce Development for Northern Virginia Family Service, which you may know is NVFS. Thank you so much for being here, Julie. Oh, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Well, great. So we've had a uh, James from Maryfield called, and sure. he had a specific question about workforce Great. training because some people are familiar with training futures That's and right. what his question was is if you move beyond training futures to have other programs. Yeah, that's a great question. We actually have, and we're really excited about some of our new programming. So over the last five years, we've been perfecting um, a one-on-one -on -one customized approach to career development with our, in partnership with our clients, and we call it career navigation. And we've been able to scale it and overlay it over several of our programs at MVFS. And what's really exciting is that unlike Training Futures, which is a co cohort-based model, it gives us the opportunity to really partner with our clients to identify their career goals no matter what they are and work with them to create goals and move uh, towards better employment outcomes for them and their families. So what we know about our clients is that often they've gone through very difficult life experiences and because of that they really come to us with a deficit mindset. So we all deep down inside know who we are in the world and who we want to be but sometimes our clients come to us thinking they don't have what it takes, they're not worthy, they're not good enough, they're never going to get there. And with the one-on-one -on -one navigator, we're really able to instill a sense of confidence and belief through that trust building and encouraging our clients and giving them the tools that they need to really get ahead. So we're able to pay for some credentials and um, help them get better skills to get better jobs and can uh, really encourage them along their pathway. Well, you know, that, and that is something, certifications, there's been a huge emphasis. Our previous governor, Terry McAuliffe, our current governor, Ralph Northam, talks about the benefit of certification programs, putting people in healthcare industries like health right. tech workers, you know, there's home health care, there's all these um, different fields that don't require a four-year college degree. Absolutely. And, and I'm sure, too, because I know from Training Futures, you do get people in here who are highly educated. But again, language is a problem, or you know, computer skills are a problem. But they're still very intelligent, very accomplished. Some of them are multilingual. It always astonished me, the number of right. languages that people speak. Yeah, absolutely. And as a community, if we're not able to really tap into that talent pool, then we really miss out. Our businesses miss out. Our community misses out. So at MVFS, we really focus on helping those people achieve those goals through small, actionable steps. Um, it's really exciting work. And I'm sure you probably have partners, too, along the way. So you're not in, in, in creating whole cloth curriculum just at NVFS. That's right. That's right. And the, the great part about our Navigator program is that we really um, have been able to, to grow the confidence of our clients. And we really rely on our partners um, to do the skill building. Because it's so customized, as you mentioned earlier in a segment, people come in with all different skill sets and, and educational backgrounds. So with one client, we might be helping them you know, recertify as a CPA, for example. And another client, we might help them you know, get English classes to get into um, more of a service industry job. Um, for some of our clients, we, we talk about small businesses, and mm -hmm. we've been able to help clients open small businesses. We have a great story of a woman who came um, over to the country um, and really didn't have a lot of English skills and um, was very nervous about that, of course, rightfully so, um, but she had a PhD in her home country and she had a lot of experience teaching. And so we were actually able to help her start a home tutoring business. As you've mentioned, you know, the language depth in our community is so rich that for people to be able to offer small businesses, even like home health care um, and um, 
childhood education, the in-home um, right. child care in specific languages is huge. And so you don't always need to know English to get that first step into your professional career. Of course, many of our clients, we um, encourage them to learn English because they're going to need it as they navigate and they all want to learn English, but we can't wait until somebody's mastered the language to really help them, you know, have career success. Well, you bring up something that is also one of my big issues and that is licensed home-based child care. Yes. And so there are many, there are two sets of working families, people right. who work inside their home to support the people working outside right. their home. Absolutely. And a lot of new immigrants are find that they are wonderful early childhood education providers Absolutely. in their home. Right. And that is just a path. Right, right. It's huge. You know, there's there's a lot of challenges and barriers in our area because it's so highly regulated. Um, so it is a long process to get your home certified and to go through all the steps. And again, that's where really having a navigator, somebody who knows the formalized system of our country, can really help clients get through that process. Um, but absolutely, I mean, particularly for cultures who really value um, one one parent, usually the woman staying home with their own children, you know, they're able to start home home care, you know, child care businesses and now take care of their own children and bring in an income and take care of other children that they might be, um, you know, the language uh, learning might be important for that culture to stay within um, as their kids, you know, learn the culture and navigate the language um, from their home countries. There, so. And there's so many benefits too. Let's think about bilingual. Most Americans speak one language, right. English, right. but you know, little children, the best time for them to learn two languages is when they're small. Right, right? absolutely. So having a, a, a child care provider who teaches your child a different language, to me, I'd pay extra for that. Right, right, absolutely. And we find that across the board. You know, some of our uh, corporate partners really value the language learners as well, or the language speakers as well. A lot of the banks in the area, you know, when they're in a community that they know is um, heavily dominated by, you know, a what the mark speakers or Spanish yep. speakers, of course, you know, they're very sensitive and they want to make sure that the service is culturally competent and language competent. And so oftentimes, you know, we become sort of an employer of choice when, when trying to fill those, those jobs. So it's not just you know home businesses it's also the corporate community that really values that right and, and so you need corporate partners right so you need Absolutely. people and there's a lot of people who are looking especially in service industries one leaps to mind is ho the hotel industry oh, yeah you know right. the, uh, the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia was they have a program where they actually teach um, literacy to English yes. learners specific to the hotel industry. Exactly. And I think how brilliant is that? It's wonderful. Yeah, it's really exciting. I'm really excited about what they're doing. And I'm glad you brought that up because as we have really perfected our career navigation approach, um, we've really looked, and as you all mentioned before, you know, we have 35,000 clients that we serve every year, and the majority of them are already working. They're just not thriving. Um, a lot of people don't realize, but in the D.C. metro area, for a family of three, a sustainable wage is about $28 an hour. And who's so, making that? Exactly. So it's very difficult for families to feel like they have what they need to really make ends meet. So our program that we're launching this winter um, is called Team Up, and we're going to be partnering with corporations and uh, helping support their frontline employees to really thrive at work. So it's a fee-for-service model, and it really targets, targets uh, businesses whose core service model is really um, run by those uh, frontline workers. So the hospitality, just as you mentioned, healthcare, manufacturing, and what we'll be doing is co-locating with the corporation and providing career navigation at their site. So you were talking earlier about how do people even find you? Well, our goal, and that's exactly what we were thinking, you know, people come to NVFS when we're in crisis and we really want to catch them before their families are in crisis. We want to help them thrive where they are at work. And so by partnering with their employees, through this fee-for-service model, the employer can really cut down on turnover and increase retention, increase you know, presenteeism, and really make sure that their employees have the connections and the social capital they need to navigate community resources so they are able to come to work without a lot of distractions, getting the support they need um, to really do well and thrive at work. You know, and what that brings to mind, too, in, as far as putting services in workplaces where you know you have low-wage workers right. is Medicaid expansion because a lot of people don't know they might be in the newly or a category Absolutely. that's in the newly expanded Medicaid. 
doing that on site. And the earned income tax credit is another one where a lot of people don't even know how to take advantage of right. that for their income level. Absolutely. But in other states, they've actually put volunteer tax preparers into companies. Absolutely. On site to yes. help them do their tax returns on site. Exactly. I'm like, it's great. No brainer. Yeah. And, and that's the exact sort of partnerships that we'll be looking at to really support frontline workers. You know, they come in for the free tax prep and then you say, hey, do you know your credit score? Would you be interested in learning more? You know, really working with them on, on some of the other needs that they might have that, you know, either they identify and they know they have it. For example, you know, I, I don't, but a client might say, I use a payday lender, you know, every pay period because I just can't make ends meet. We can help them, you know, with their budget and really helping them avoid uh, predatory lending like that. Um, and again, that's a huge stress relief for a family to just be able to better budget the money that they have, connect them, you know, with other resources, um, you know, that whatever is really um, well so i sit on the board of bright pass and financial okay. literacy is what oh, we do yeah, and so i know and but financial literacy is what we kind of pivoted yes. toward and now we're sort of in this workforce development space out of the south county financial yes. empowerment center yes. right the same idea exactly. that you bring people in and try to figure out but the payday lending particularly in certain areas of northern virginia is a real problem because right. people do not understand how to manage their money, how to avoid it, and they can't get out once they've gotten in. Right. It's it's really difficult. Yeah, I absolutely love Bright Paths. They're a great partner and are doing a fantastic job with the Financial Empowerment Center. And I think those are the types of, of um, programs that we really look to when we know that it's a really high quality service. Um, and they, you know, take a similar approach to that one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and that's exactly what clients need. You know, I think in our in our world, we're moving towards everything being online, and it, to an extent, it's great because suddenly there is skill-based learning at you know people's fingertips. But on the other hand, a lot of vulnerable populations can get really lost trying to navigate that and keep up with it. So whether it's financial mentoring or credentials, um, having that one-on-one -on -one customized support throughout really makes a difference for our clients. Oh, it definitely does because sometimes you just need the support of knowing that somebody's there to help you. If you get into a bind or you have a question or you just need somebody to say, it'll right. be okay. Like, yeah. really, it's going to be okay. Right. We have some so really great stories. For example, we have a client who had, had gone through coursework to become a CNA and just was having trouble passing this last piece of the exam. And, you know, she failed it and thought, yep, I'm not good enough. I'm never going to get there. And our career navigator lent her a computer, downloaded a bunch of skills training videos around the piece that she was um, having trouble passing, encouraged her and made a plan with her how many videos to watch each week. He really, you know, encouraged her through it. And sure enough, she passed the exam and, you know, he delivered a, a photo framed of her and her new certificate. And that it was that sort of support and that sort of encouragement that really got her to that credential. Had she been trying to navigate it on her own, she would have given up thinking, I'm not good enough and I'm never going to get there on my own. So it's very powerful. It is. And here's the thing. All of these people who come here who need help, it's human potential. Absolutely. Like everybody's got a tremendous amount of potential and it's unrealized unless we can figure out how to solve their basic right. needs and put them with employers who are looking for really good right. employees. It's a win-win. The other thing we see in our clients is that when they achieve, achieve that career goal, they change, you know, it changes the way they see themselves in the world and they really are able to see that they do have agency and they are, you know, able to, to achieve other goals and support their children in, in you know, getting more education and, and achieving. Well, and that's why people come here, right? People come here because they believe yep. all those things are possible. And thank you, Julie, for being here and explaining how this program, Workforce Development, Team Up, and your career navigator is helping people in this area. We're not done yet, so join us after the break. This is the story of a boy who was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where nothing could get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. It made him feel uncomfortable. One day, he found out he had something called autism. His family got him help, and slowly, he learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> selfies, nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on man, let's put a ride home. 
is an adventure full of special moments. A cruise? Surprise! Unexpected moments. I got this. And even awkward moments. Okay, Dad, thank you. <laughs> but every moment you spend with your kids, <laughs> even the smallest moments, <laughs> can make the biggest impact on your child's life. So take a moment to be a dad today. <laughs> so, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and tonight we're talking with the leadership team from Northern Virginia Family Service, maybe better known to you as NVFS. In our final segment, we are talking with Andrea McIntyre Hall. She is the Director of Health Access and Nutrition Services. Thank you for being here, Andrea. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. So, basic nutrition. You know, in a country that has an abundance, we are not in a potato famine here. It is astonishing the number of families who on a daily basis suffer from food insecurity. Correct. And that is one of those things that you cannot survive without, and Correct. that is food. Correct. So how are you meeting this staggering in this area, this staggering demand for, for nutritious food? So at our Hunger Resource Center in Prince William County, located on our SERV campus, we serve anywhere between six and 700 um, families a month um, who come, for us, uh, come to us for food insufficiency. Um, it's an opportunity for them to come monthly to get that resource to help supplement um, the other things that they would normally spend or try to spend their resources on. Um, we also offer um, cooking demonstrations and nutrition services as well. It's a partnership that we have with Virginia Cooperative Extension. Um, and we do that because oftentimes there are a lot of things that we get at the Hunger Resource Center through our partnerships with the farmers markets, um, U.S. Foods, USDA, that um, people from other cultures aren't necessarily uh, familiar with. Yes. They're not familiar with them, but <laughs> yes. we feel the same way yes. if we were in Thailand, I'm sure. Exactly, exactly. So it's an opportunity to help people understand how to prepare those foods um, that are more um, let's say culturally appropriate for them and the spices, you know, what works with a head of cabbage if you've never had, you know, a head of cabbage right. or not. Um, some of the other things that we've done with our Hunger Resource Center is um, really ensuring that we have good quality food. And so when it comes to fresh fruits and vegetables, there are no limits on the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables that folks are able to get while they're at the Hunger Resource Center. Um, we really kind of shifted um, away from um, providing some of those foods that are not nutritionally dense. But they're shelf stable. So let's just have Correct. some real talk about food banks Yes. and our, our best intentions to make sure people don't go hungry. But food is health. Food is wellness. And so Correct. what you're putting into your body, it Correct. might stave off your hunger, but it may make you not healthy. That is absolutely true, and you're right. So um, one of the things that we're able to do at the Hunger Resource Center is kind of account for people's um, dietary requirements. So we ask people, do they have particular chronic conditions that they need to be able to have low sodium or low cholesterol or no sugar, uh, particularly for our diabetics, um, so that we're able to meet that nutritional need for them. The other thing is really kind of pulling some of those um, you know, the chips and the um, uh, the Doritos and the candies and all of that. We make sure that we don't try to provide, you know, people should have access to that every now and then because we all want access to those things. But not but as a steady diet. Exactly. And exactly. some food banks, I think, recently really have said there are things that will, they won't accept. Absolutely. And I think that's wise. Absolutely. It, you know, we work, um, we partner with some of the other um, 
the other pantries in the right. community as well. Because we get so much food, we right. um, process about 3.3 million pounds of food through our Hunger Resource mm -hmm. Center a year. And we actually distribute to some of the smaller pantries in the community, which is really good because a lot of them don't have access to the fresh fruits and vegetables. Right. And we get an abundance of that. So it's another way to get that food into those communities where um, it's closer to the folks that maybe can't even come to the Hunger Resource Center as well. Um, and our Hunger Resource is, uh, Center is only in Prince William County. It, um, is, it does not necessarily serve the rest of the, it's a the big, region. It's a big area. I mean, Northern Absolutely. Virginia is a huge area with, you know, over a million people in it. Absolutely. So trying to get, the, and especially because they're perishable, and this is always the challenge with things like fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. is that they're perishable. Absolutely. So, um, it, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about how do we continue to get the fresh fruits and vegetables out into the community? So one of the things that we are developing is a fruit and vegetable prescription program in partnership with George Mason University's uh, Mason and Partners Clinic. Um, as working with their um, students to design this program, what we're really interested in doing is um, a lot of the health safety nets, so your free clinics and your FQHCs, uh, they have patients that don't necessarily have the resources to support that healthy diet that they right. need. And so what we're developing is an approach where they get a prescription card based on the chronic disease that they have that they can bring to the Hunger Resource Center and fill that weekly so that they get the access to the fresh fruits and vegetables that oh, they need. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. That is great. I think people are getting, you know, Bright Paths has a program where we have uh, vouchers for veggies at the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. This is another way to encourage our clients to go and take advantage of our partners in the farmer's market who are willing to give fresh fruits and vegetables. Absolutely. But you know, even children, and this is kind of another, you know, a lot of kids don't eat vegetables. I think mine didn't. Mm -hmm. but, but what we're feeding them even in our public schools, we're trying to turn the corner on salad bars and healthier foods in the school instead of a lot of the prepackaged, less healthful foods. Because a lot of, um, a lot of kids in the county, their main meal is what they eat at school. Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that we really try to do is encourage, um, uh, families to be able to sign up for free and reduced lunch or even to sign up for SNAP benefits because it's an opportunity to supplement their um, their uh, food diets at right. their at their home, the resources that they have available. Um, there's a couple of coalitions as well in the community that work really hard to partner with um, the schools in understanding what um, what are some strategies that can be used to increase the access to food for some of the families who are struggling to get um, that meal outside of that breakfast and that I lunch know. that they're getting at school. They have a number of Backpack Buddy programs yeah, as well. Yeah, Bright Pass has one, Food for Thought. Mm -hmm. And so we're sending, and we, but uh, sometimes that seems so hit or miss. You hope that you're getting the students who need it the most. Sometimes right. it's hard to know. Right. And, you know, so let's talk a little bit, let's pivot a minute to social determinants of health, which is a, uh, a term I really like because I get it. Mm -hmm. I get what that is, that when we talk about health, we, most of us think about vaccinations and medical care, somebody to treat right. our cold or our flu or our diabetes. But social determinants health, it takes in a whole broad yes. array of things that impact our health and well-being. Absolutely. You know, it's said that when you actually go to that doctor visit, that's about 10 to 15 percent of what comprises your health. It's that other 85 to, you know, 90 percent that happens before you even get to the, uh, the doctor's office that actually impacts your health. Um, you know, we, do you have access to health care? Um, do you, can you pay that co-visit when you, uh, that co-payment when you get there? Um, do you have child care? Is somebody able to watch your child so that you can even go to the doctor? Does somebody speak your language when you go to the doctor's office? Um, there are all those things that impact the ability to actually be, you know, healthy. Um, do you live in a community where there's a food desert? Right. You know, do you, um, do you have, uh, do you work a living wage? You know, are you able to be housed in a safe and affordable, you know, community? Uh, what does your environment look like? Do you have walkable spaces in your community? Is your community safe? Um, there were all those things that really impact our stress levels that, you know, in turn impact our health as well. So there's been a huge number of studies done on zip codes and yes. how which zip code we live in 
determines our longevity. And Absolutely. for a variety of reasons, some of it's medical care or food deserts or appropriate housing, some of it's things like gun violence. Yes. So they can look at zip codes and say, well, we can pretty much figure, and this to me seems very wrong because if you can identify where we have these islands of, of um, inadequate services for mm -hmm. people, we should, we should be focusing more energy on that. Absolutely. So a lot of it, a lot of it speaks to, um, you know, social injustice and structural uh, institutional racism, um, all of those things that uh, really impact policies that affect a community. Um, you know, those are the, the, the challenges where we need, you know, um, organizations to be able to advocate for better policies for those, you know, communities. Um, when we think about those 15 islands of disadvantage, it's really looking at the level of poverty, you know, in those communities as compared to um, those communities that are right next door. You know, uh, Andrea mentioned in one of the earlier segments, there's a lot of affluence in our, our region, but it gets the poverty level, the poverty gets hidden, you know, in those little pockets because people think, you know, for example, Loudoun County, you know, is the second richest, first richest, you know, county. In the whole country. Exactly. The whole country. But they actually have some islands of disadvantage in their community. So it's all of those things, you know, um, low education levels, low literacy. Um, they're working service jobs that make a low wage. Absolutely. A lot of times, if, if you're living in affordable housing, Centerville is one of these examples. It's a transportation desert. If you don't have yes. a car, you can't have a job. Absolutely. And how many people can afford a car or afford to keep it running? Absolutely. And another thing is child care. Right. Think about the cost of child care. It is one of the major barriers for people being, you know, employed. Um, a lot of families find that somebody is working a job just to pay the child, you know, just to, to pay the, the child, child care. Yes, absolutely. Right. Um, but, you know, Northern Virginia Family Service, we have our early childhood programs, our Head Start and our Early Head Start program. And one of the complements to those programs is the access to subsidies to help pay for child care. And so it really wraps a lot of services around those families so that they get the supports that they need so that they can actually thrive. And all of these pieces really kind of have to come t together, which is one I think is the strength of NVFS is that you figured out how to put these programs not in silos, Correct. but integrating them. And then you make a tremendous collaborative effort with other organizations, the county government, grants, funds, foundations, in order to scale that. And I, I really do think that is unique to NVFS. I don't think everybody realizes how much you're able to do with what you have. Well, and, you know, part of that is just really innovating and thinking outside of the box and understanding where you can break down those walls. Um, you know, one of the things that we do, example again for our early childhood program, is not of all our not all of our children are necessarily eligible for um, Medicaid, and so we have programs within the agency that will get them access to a medical home that they need so that they can thrive. So, you know, we're we're a work in progress. And we're still looking at all of our programs and how do we bust those walls down for those silos so that when a person shows up at any door, they get the service that helps make their family whole. Um, so yeah, it's a... It's a well, um, 95 years and counting. So I think you must be doing something right. And I think clearly Jeff Bezos thinks you're doing something right because he's invested in helping you to solve the problems surrounding homelessness Absolutely. here in Northern Virginia. And yes. I thank you so much for being on the show, thank Andrea. You. Thank I you. I do want to remind all of our viewers at home that you can become involved with Northern Virginia Family Service. There are opportunities to donate, there's opportunities to volunteer, there's opportunities to give your time, talent, and treasure to people in our community who really need the support from people like you. And everybody has something to offer. Everyone can do something. So in this holiday season, think about Northern Virginia Family Service.